Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion where we'll talk about supporting international students. Um, so my name is Carol Hernandez. I'm one of the senior instructional designers at the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at Stony Brook University. And I'm here with my co-facilitator, Catherine Scott. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm Catherine Scott. I'm the Assistant Director for Faculty Development, Testing, Assessment, and Evaluation in CELT. Um, we just want to give a special thank you to uh, Rose Tirada Esposito and Patricia Seves, our um, fabulous leaders, and the rest of our CELT team for always helping us put these things together. So um, we're just going to start with a couple of um, um, remarks about what we do at CELT. Um, so our focus is on excellent teaching through collaboration with faculty. And um, the purpose of these panel discussions is just to create a space for faculty to come from different disciplines to talk about what excellent teaching looks like for them. And um, also to talk about inclusive teaching and what that might look like. So there's many ways to be inclusive um, with our students. So that is the purpose of today's talk. And so some of the things that we're going to address are what are some of the challenges faced by our international students here at Stony Brook? Um, what can faculty do to support our international students? We're hoping that there is some self-reflection on your own teaching within your own disciplines. Um, there's some interrogating of your teaching assumptions, challenging the status quo, and hopefully we provide you with some tips and strategies for taking action moving forward. So um, this um, panel discussion we felt was, um, it was really a broad topic that could be of interest to a lot of faculty at a lot of different institutions. So we opened it up and um, we do have faculty represented from other institutions. And so we just wanted to sort of give you an idea of where we're physically located. We're in Suffolk County in uh, New York, in Long Island. And this is just a, a map to just situate you um, where we are. So here um, are some, some numbers that I pulled this morning from our um, enrollment dashboard that just shows you um, who our international students are, where they're from, and how many we have. And um, so you can basically see that we have a lot of representation from Asia, from that location in the world. And um, when you look at that and break it down a little bit more, we have a lot of students from China, India, Korea, Taiwan, Pakistan, Japan and Bangladesh. Um, and um, this information, of course, came from the Office of Institutional Research, Planning and Effectiveness. And you can also see that we, we saw the numbers go down um, between fall 2019 and fall 2020. And um, you know that's probably because of the pandemic. Oops, sorry about that. So now we are going to uh, turn it over to our panelists and have them introduce themselves so that you get an idea of who we'll be speaking with today. So I'm going to turn it over to Liz first to introduce herself. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Kutsayas. You can call me Liz. Um, I am a senior lecturer for the program in academic English and also for the program in writing and rhetoric. Um, I'm Elma Dianas, I'm a PhD candidate in mathematics at Stony Brook um, in the mathematics department, and I'm also a TA. I'd like to also say perhaps soon to be a doctor in a couple of weeks, because that's what I'm defending. Uh, and uh, I, am, I was born and raised in Morocco, and I came here as an international student. I also continued um, grad school in the US, so I'll give perspectives at, both as a student and an educator. Hi everyone, thanks for being here today for this important topic. I'm excited to talk with everyone. And I am Kimberly Bell, I'm a postdoctoral associate in CELT. And I also did my PhD here in the genetics program. 
Hi, I'm Troy Priest. I'm a senior instructional designer here in CELT. I also teach um, some master's courses in higher education, international higher education in the uh, administration course. So I teach higher education in higher education administration here at Stony Brook. I'm also a PhD candidate in uh, higher education research and effectiveness. And it's good, good to see you all. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Si Chen. I am a principal research support specialist as well as an adjunct advisor in the School of Social Welfare here in Stony Brook. I'm also teaching the freshman seminar courses here in Stony Brook. So feel free to ask any question and we're so excited to talk to you more about our experiences on this important topic. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for your introduction. So um, we had some questions submitted previously um, so I'm going to go through some of those questions, but please, if anybody has any additional questions, please throw them in the chat. We're going to be monitoring them, and we're hoping that we'll be able to get to as many of those as possible. So, all right. So the first question is, can, um, can you all talk a little bit about your experiences either teaching international students, being an international student, or teaching in international settings? Whoever wants to go first. I'll start. Um, I have been uh, working as a, le a lecturer for the program in academic English since 2000. We formerly were known as the ESL program. And um, I have also taught for the Intensive English Center and the program in writing and rhetoric. Um, I have extensive uh, experience teaching all skills, which would be reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Um, I've taught international teaching assistants as well. And I am currently teaching one section of writing in academic English at the advanced level. This course is a synchronous course. And I'm also teaching two writing 101 workshop courses for the program in writing and rhetoric. And those courses are um, asynchronous. Thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I'm Troy Priest. Um, I, I'm, I've been here at Stony Brook for about almost two years, a year and a half, two years. Prior to being at Stony Brook, I spent um, about 18 years in um, the United Arab Emirates where I was teaching at an a English medium institution that taught mostly um, local Arab uh, Emirati students um, with some international students there. So I was there for about 18 years, uh, to, taught English and also did faculty development there. Um, and then worked on some interventions to help fac uh, help students with different um, different um, learning, you know, interventions. One around academic language and one around critical thinking. Before I was um, in the United Arab Emirates, um, I was spent a couple years in South Korea teaching as well. So I've, I've been overseas for most of my career. So. Okay. Um, I guess I could jump in. So. As I said earlier, I was born and raised in Morocco, which means that I spent 17 years of my life educated in the uh, Moroccan educational system. I was in a bilingual school, um, so I'm quite familiar with the North African system in general, but I'm also familiar with um, the French school system, for example, because that, that's what our school system was modeled off of. Um, otherwise, I uh, came to the US for college, so I came here uh, as a college student, so I have experience as an international student in the US. And I'm also currently finishing grad school in the US. So um, I, that gave me experience as uh, an international educator uh, to American students. I can go next. Um, <clears throat> so, um... I've been teaching college students in general in some form or other for the past 10 plus years, but I've really had a chance to deliberately implement and teach about inclusive pedagogy in various contexts during this postdoc in CELT over the last four years. But it is something I've been passionate about in both teaching and general communications well before I started here in CELT. Um, currently, I teach in the undergraduate college Science and Society, the first year seminar is both 101 and a 102 course um, so that, you know, that we have a lot of international students, uh, first generation non native English speakers, all of those, all of the above in those courses. And they're, you know, transitioning into college. So it's a particular 
place for them to get support. So I really had a great experience and learned a lot there. Um, you know, not only from my own teaching, but from the orientations, talking to other instructors, learning about all these different strategies. Um, but interestingly, where I really first started to think about this is when I was a lab technician at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. It's a very international community there um, with, a, you know, a, a large portion of graduate students, postdocs, faculty, and staff that do not speak English as their first language. So having to receive mentoring from them, provide mentoring, um, work collaboratively on experiments, uh, you know, just thinking about how to best communicate clearly, concisely with plain language um, really started back then. So thanks. My turn. Um, so actually, uh, I also came to America since I was starting the middle uh, school system. So I was growing up in China for my entire uh, elementary school system. So I really see the difference between a different education system from China versus America. But also came here, I also received so much support and mentorship during my entire high school, middle school, and also college journey. So I'm a social worker right now, and I'm a social worker focused in the specialization in higher education because I received so much love and support. I want to be a part of this amazing system and support back with everyone else. So within my entire uh, five year of college experiences, I was both undergrad and grad in Stony Brook here. And I was being the tour guy who was doing international uh, student tour, but also additionally, I've been international student advisor, which helps in like helping them to both adjusting to the college system in America, even before they're here, uh, teaching them how to do class selections, kind of just help them to like um, know and more in depth on what is the difference between the systems before they even arrive here. However, later in my uh, education life, I was able to be the instructors, being that one-on-one -on -one support, just like Kimberly said, to help them to like learn and adjust and actually felt involved in the community of Sony Brook once they arrived on campus. So I basically can teach and felt on both sides of systems and really enjoy the experiences to be both international instructor and also advisors in different perspective. Great. Okay. So um, our next question is, um, what are some challenges you have encountered as a student or educator in these instances of working with international students? And if you can also address, um, we had a question come into the chat, and I think it kind of intertwines with this question. So if you can also address um, uh, what things end up being most confusing for someone coming into the American system. So if if you have some experience with that, if you can kind of touch on that as well, I think that would be great. Thanks. Um, I'll have a go at that question since I, uh, I said that I would answer that. Um, I think uh, I'm in a position to answer that question well. So what can be confusing uh, uh, from my perspective as, as somebody that came here as an international student about the American system is, I think first and foremost, the uh, near absence of specialization when you just get started. Um, so, for example, in Morocco, as soon as what well, would be ninth grade in the US, we have to choose a track. So there is a literature track or a science track um, or a technical track, meaning, you know, technical engineering sciences, things like that. So you choose that track. And then by the end of 10th grade, you have to choose a specialization. So for example, if you did science, it's going to be mathematical sciences or physical sciences or something like that. And then after that, for the last year of high school, you choose an option. Um, so in the US, it doesn't work that way because you can be an undecided major for like two years after you started college. So for a lot of us that already came specialized, it's, it's like, it, it's as if you kind of break all of a sudden, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, somewhat unexpected. Um, to me, that was not such a big surprise because when I was 14, I just wanted to know a lot more math and I ended up watching a lot of videos uh, on the MIT OpenCourseWare and that uh, kind of made me a bit more curious about the American system as a whole. So when I had that surprise, that was three years before I went to the US. So I kind of expected that. But a lot of friends that I had who were international students just did not expect that. You know, if you compare it to most places, you know, uh, say Germany as an example in Europe, they specialize early to the point that you will be put in a special type of high school, depending on, you know, your grades and skills. 
uh, in France, it's similar to uh, Morocco, more so not North Africa is in fact like that. So I think that that was one of the most confusing things, the, the level of liberality in, in, in studies in the US. Uh, also the level of freedom that you have in choosing your courses, because we just don't have that. You know, for, uh, the, the choice of courses is not exactly a thing in, in many other countries. So as good of a thing as it is, um, if you've been kind of oriented your whole life, depending on you know your natural strengths, uh, it can be hard to navigate the American system unless you have a really good college advisor. Um, so that can be a hit or miss, you know, depending on whether they, they can connect with you as an international student or not. Uh, I connected well with my advisors because I kind of chose them for the most part. I had emailed people be, before I went to college, but um, if you have a student that doesn't naturally have a sense of initiative and you're just randomly assigned to them, that can be a challenge for them because you know, th their whole life, most things are chosen for them and all they have to do is essentially study hard and move on. But then you come to the US, you have to actually make reasonable choices for who you are as a person, you know, what kind of electives, even within your major, what kind of courses make sense for you to fulfill that major and so on. Uh, I think that that would be uh, one of the main confusions about the American system. Um, as far as the challenges in so far as teaching international students, I would say probably um, cultural clashes of sorts. Uh, I think it's mostly related to this confusion about the American system. So American students have certain expectations that a lot of international students don't, given the uh, amount of orientation they had during high school, right? So the way that college is set up in the US is not that different from the way high school is set up in the US. So, you know, students are not oriented to a point where a path is essentially laid out for them and they just have to follow it, right? I mean, you have a bit of freedom. You choose what APs you want to take, potentially what courses you want to take. There's no fixed years. You know, you don't have to take AP Calc as, I don't know, as a freshman or something like that. You can take it your last year. Some people are really good. They take it as juniors, same with other AP courses. If you're in a place like, say, Morocco, you don't choose those courses. You know, there's a structure. It's very linear. It's this is a first year course. It's a second year course and so on. Right. So you don't have those choices, meaning that um, the amount of rigidity and structure for people that come outside of the U.S. forces them to have different expectations. I think in that that's probably one of the main challenges. It's navigating those expectations. So. Great. Thank I you. I can follow up on that. Yes, Sorry, please. Didn't mean no. to interrupt the transition. Nope. Okay. So I, along the same lines, it's vaguely related to what El Mendy was just talking about. But um, I've had challenges like just knowing when my students, particularly international students, when they need help. Um, they might be sitting there misunderstanding. I might be talking too fast, or I think I'm being clear and using words they understand, but I might have used you know, a colloquialism or like some cliched type of, of phrase that, uh, you know, it was just not being uh, comprehended. But, you know, there's also the other side that they've, a lot of international students have been in educational systems where instructors are the like supreme authority in a way. So they might not be open to asking questions or letting me know they need help despite my efforts to appear open to questions and say, you know, it's, great, please come to my office hours. I'd be absolutely happy to help you if you're ever unsure about anything. Um, you know, they still might not be engaging with me. So just trying to be aware of those things and maybe checking in a little extra often has sort of helped navigate some of those misunderstandings, but it is, uh, it remains a challenge. I actually cannot agree more with Kimberly what just said, because like a lot of times, yes, for the transition from like not just high school to college. I think a lot of the uh, domestic students also have this uh, issue when they first transition from high school to college is like, oh, they don't realize the resource is there. They don't realize they have to make the initiative because different from high school, uh, a different from high school and college is like high school, the teacher can be more spoon feeding. They can be telling you more like, oh, this is what you need to do. This is that, this is that. If you uh, miss this assignment, we can make it up for this assignment. We can do that. But in college, a lot of time is, we are here for you. But if you don't make that first step to reach out, we cannot knock on 
let's say 400 students door, say, here's your, your assignment, here's a job for you, here's your writing section. They have to make that initiative. So this is another layer of difficulty for international students because first they're adjusting to the new college systems, but also they're also adjusting to a new country where they have this language barrier, they have to feel comfortable to reach out. So imagine the students who just uh, came to United States who kind of think about like, okay, maybe the teacher will reach out to them and then not even, and sometimes maybe even feel embarrassed to reach out because they don't want to showcase their English uh, language skill, which happened to a lot of my students. Sometimes they just feel more comfortable at first to talk in their native language. Luckily, I was able to com uh, communicate with them in their native language, but they still have this like, oh, I, I don't want to cause trouble to others. I don't want to feel like I'm a bother to others. So this kind of lip limiting them from reaching out. However, once you like make sure they understand this very clear on like, we are here for you and all these resources are free for you to use. You are part of this bigger community. They're more likely to go to, let's say, a Biden section. Let's uh, even more to like office hour to professors. I cannot like imagine how much discussion I had with my students after I told them these hours are me sitting there and open for you guys to just come in and talk to us. After that was clear, Every week I have students come into my office hour and just chat with me, not just about the course itself, but like how their experiences are going, how they're adjusting to American systems, or if they have any question about their life, about like just normally using anything on college. But they have to make sure the barrier is overcome. They have to make sure they feel like, oh, this is made for me. I can feel free to use it without feel like I'm a bother to professors, staff, or advisors. I'd like to jump in and just um, share some of the challenges, you know, that, that you're talking about, Shi Chen. For sure, our international students um, do face uh, challenges in the writing classroom. I'll, I'll speak from that perspective. Um, they don't have the um, academic language proficiency that's really needed to address uh, complex writing assignments. And um, something that I think is important for everyone here to know is that it takes seven years, approximately seven years or more to acquire academic language proficiency. And um, so, so students, especially if they're from Asia, they are, they're very shy to ask questions, but they need to ask questions. And um, this, is, this is very important for them uh, you know, to do, to engage in, um, in, their, in their classwork. Like you said, Chi Chen, go to office hours, um, even joining clubs. This is what we have to do as faculty. I feel like we need to encourage them to engage as much as possible. And it really um, does make a difference for them. If they know that they, that they can count on us, if we encourage them, they will succeed. Does anybody, yeah, I, I just want Go ahead, yeah, I, I just, just want to make yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I'm just kind of reiterating what everyone else has said, but I think what, what I found in, in my time working overseas in two different environments is that there's just often a lot of assumptions made by, were made by me as a faculty as to what a college and university student should be. And of course, there's a lot of cultural values that are attached to that. You know, we're doing that, we're looking at that from, I was looking at that from a, my experience as an American university student and what, what does it mean to be a, a university student? Um, and then also, I think this was brought up earlier too, the language um, is, is a barrier, even for students who have very high TOEFL scores or IELTS scores, the colloquial language or some of the idiomatic language that Kim was talking about can be a very big challenge for our students. And one of the things I found that I needed to do was be aware that those students you know, just just being aware that the students might need me to simplify the language a little bit just for clarity and understanding. Um, and so I think, yeah, just not making assumptions about what they know or what they don't know either, um, but also making, um, you know, kind of reaching out to them. One thing I found that's really, really important, particularly when there's a cross-cultural, you know, kind of, um, I wouldn't say divide, but there's, you know, maybe some cross-cultural um, differences would be just building rapport with those students is really, really important. And I found, um, you know, that that can go a long way once they trust you and you can, you show interest in their, in their lives. And I know if you have a large class, it's hard to do, but if you can, you know, even if it's just reaching out to the, if you know, there's this, um, several international students within the course and reaching out to them, even as a group, but separately and saying, you know, 
um, you know, just trying to get to know them a little bit better and just being aware of some of, of, of where they're coming from. Like right now is the holy month of Ramadan for Muslims. So um, they're fasting all day and, you know, that is going to affect how they, how they, you know, how their day goes um, day in and day out. And so um, not that you necessarily have to make exceptions to, to the rigor of your course, but maybe just some understanding and empathy kind of goes a long way. Um, okay, so not to be the dead horse, but I want to insist <laughs> one more time on the linguistic issue because that 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 one is, is a really important thing. It's it's a serious problematic. So uh, to give you an example, I I'm writing a thesis right now, fully in English. Uh, I was a philosophy double major in college. I still have problems expressing myself in English sometimes, knowing that I started when I was ten years old. I spent years studying at the, at the American Language Center in Casablanca, Morocco. Uh, years reading books, watching videos in English movies, you know, what have you. Uh, the problem is I was taught by people who are not native speakers throughout my schooling, even at the American Language Center. So they were bound to make mistakes that I picked up. Uh, same with some of the things that I read in writing. You know, sometimes I read things that were written in British English rather than American English, and I didn't necessarily know what the difference was and so on. So just it's, it's not because a student has spent many years, perhaps as you correctly imagine, studying English as an international student outside the US that they, they will be completely adapted linguistically speaking. That, that's something that really has to be kept in mind. For example, I, I only did well on my philosophy assignments in college because I had an advisor who told me the right thing to do, which is write simple sentences. The moment I started writing convoluted sentences, it was an issue because then, my French writing style would start to blend in and then I'm kind of translating my French thoughts in English and that's it, you know? So, and, and so that's a problem because the sentence structures are just not the same. Um, so that's an important thing. Also, many international students are taught to ace the language exams for admissions purposes. So it's not because they ace that exam that they're, you know, English masters. It's just not the case. That's Sorry, such a Tony, good point. I, I just wanted to, I, I used to teach writing as well, and I taught in both Korea and, 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 and in, the, in the Middle East. And, you know, there is, um, there is a rhetorical style to writing, particularly academic writing, and, and English is very linear. It's, you say it, you say it again, and then you say it again. You kind of, you know, you give your thesis, and you give all your, you know, then you build your, your argument, and then you sum up your argument a third time. And so it, it kind of follows a very linear path, more or less. Um, but other rhetorical styles are not so linear and can seem, you know, to, to me as an English writing instructor as maybe missing the point or, or, or not as cohesive as I would think it would be. But within their rhetorical academic style, it, 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 uh, it is. And so, you know, it doesn't always translate sometimes. And that's a skill that just kind of students develop over time. But just being aware of it, I think it can make me as an instructor, um, you know, help them and give them the kind of advice in their writing that, that can be helpful. So just wanted to reiterate that point. I'd like to add something uh, about academic writing. Um, at one point, our demographic at Stony Brook changed from domestic ESL students to primarily international students. And once that happened, we had to really make a shift in curriculum and pedagogy in our writing classes in order to address um, our students' needs. And um, at this time too, you know, there was kind of a, this new thing going on. Plagiarism seemed to be on an uptick and we couldn't understand why we were explaining what to do, you know, telling our students, make sure that you use quotation marks, make sure that you paraphrase, use your own language so on and so forth. And many students were still having a really challenging time. Um, around 2015, John Civil wrote an article for the, um, for the TESOL journal and it's called Reframing Plagiarism. I think the rest of the title is something like Insights, Fairness and Instructional Opportunity, something like that. This article is phenomenal. It was life-changing for me um, as an instructor. Uh, he basically, the gist is that, that international students plagiarize unintentionally. Moreover, they, um, they actually need to employ some strategies such as patch writing in order to develop their, their language learning. 
So knowing that, I, I was able to empathize with my students a lot more and be forgiving and not be so strict in terms of my requirements in academic writing. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to point that out. Great, thank you. Okay, so I, I really feel like you guys kind of touched on this next question, um, but I'm gonna ask it in case you wanna flesh it out a little bit more. And it kind of, again, intertwines with one of the questions that we got in the chat. So um, the next question is, you know, what are some challenges inter international students face that faculty should be aware of, right? Um, what do you wish faculty knew, knew about international students? And then again, um, from the chat, the question is, uh, you know, some international students have to deal with the stigma of being seen as less than by instructors, meaning instructors treat them as confused, helpless, and have difficulty understanding the American way. How do you, as instructors, thoughtfully combat that stigma? So if somebody wants to um, yeah, address I, that. I could jump in for the first part. Please. Um, just a couple of quick things. I had a lot of things that I wish faculty knew about international students, but just a couple of um, quick points. So yeah, I just wanna echo what Liz just said about the plagiarism um, or unintentional plagiarism rather, uh, and a little bit more of where I've seen this coming from. And it also echoes back to my previous point where students won't necessarily tell you if they need help um, and they're nervous and they're stressed and they're unconfident about their language skills, right? Um, so this might lead them to unintentionally plagiarize or they don't understand what the definitions of academic dishonesty are. Um, and then you might be like a bit confused because maybe they speak very well, um, but the writing isn't the same because they're more confident with being able to speak than write or vice versa. So that could pose an additional challenge. Um, so and para, you know, I, <laughs> I've been trying to teach an intro to communicating science-ish sort of uh, freshman seminar where we talk about jargon and um, news literacy and, and things like that and finding bias sources. And I kept telling them to paraphrase, paraphrase, use your own words, use your own words, right? But sort of not realizing how hard it is to do that if you're not a native English speaker. Um, so I've, I've tried to really be aware of what I'm putting into those assignments because it can be very difficult for students. Um, also, several students have mentioned to me that a lot of their other professors, even in writing courses, don't bother to correct their writing or grammar. And this sort of relates a little bit to the question in the chat where they either see them already as a hopeless cause, right? I, I can't fix the student's writing. I can't help. Um, or they are like being extra lenient, right? So maybe not providing the constructive feedback that's necessary. But I've had students tell me that they appreciate if they are given constructive feedback, um, because otherwise, how are they gonna learn to do better? So that might be something to consider. And then just two really quick things that I've noticed if two um, you know, students that aren't native English speakers are chatting during class, they might not just be chatting with each other, they might be helping each other. I mean, and this is particularly noticeable in face-to-face -face classes, um, so where, you know, a quick explanation of what's on the slide or a recap of what you just said might be going on and you're seeing it as just chatting. Um, so that might be something else to think about. And then for TAs um, that are international, I work with the, our graduate students and other postdocs a lot for their teaching. Um, this is also an issue there, right? Imagine not only having to take a class as an international student, but now you have to teach as an international student. And that's a whole nother level of being in the spotlight, a place to, to maybe lack confidence. Um, your students aren't understanding you, you're not understanding them, and it can be very stressful. So if you do work with international TAs in your courses, um, they may need a little more support. But also, again, they have that support. If you help them build the confidence, let them know how they could communicate, provide some other avenues, they tend to really flourish and do very, very well. We do offer courses to the ITAs that are great um, in the program in academic English. And they do thrive once they take those classes. We teach presentation skills, oral oral skills, but I don't think all ITAs are um, required to take it. One thing I was would like to <clears throat> follow up with Kimberly, and I, I agree, you know, like with, it, it's really important, I think, with um, to understand the expectations that international students have in terms of feedback and making sure you communicate exactly what kind of feedback you're giving, and, or at least I'm, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to myself, 
when I was working with international students, I found that I was often doing one of two things. As a new, instru as a new instructor many years ago, I felt like I had to correct every single mistake that the, um, you know, that the writer or the student made. And because um, I felt like I wasn't doing my job otherwise, or the opposite would be, you know, I would maybe not give enough feedback. And then they felt that they're, they were overly confident in what they were, had produced and it really wasn't as good as maybe they thought they had done. And so, you know, what I often would do with writing particularly was I would tell them, these are the things I'm really looking at in terms of grammatical issues. I mean, not that everyone needs to be a grammar teacher uh, and maybe I saw in the chat, you know, uh, someone said, you know, maybe faculty think that's not their, their role and that, you know, that's, that's understandable. But what I would do is just say, hey, I'm not looking at everything. Obviously the content's important because that's what the course is about. Um, but I'm going to look at some of these issues and kind of give you some advice on some of this. That doesn't mean you don't have other mistakes, but just kind of being very clear about it. So, um, so that they know that that's what's actually happening. And then they don't either have one, they feel completely overwhelmed by the, too much red on their paper or the other, they feel completely um, confident that their paper's almost perfect and it's not. Um, someone asked me in the chat if I um, experienced reverse culture shock coming back. Um, and I would say, yeah, <laughs> I had on the, in the summers, I would often come back to the United States um, after we had long summers and nice holidays, but strangely, it was always nice coming home because it felt like home, but it was when I went back to Abu Dhabi, which is where I lived for so many years, it, it felt like home going back as well. So, um, and I think homesickness is one thing that hasn't, maybe hasn't been brought up enough, but I have really experienced that, particularly when I was in Korea, and it's it is a you know it's a it's a high anxiety inducing experience, and um, and and you feel helpless and you feel like nothing makes sense, and then you're also trying to you know succeed academically and trying to manage your coursework. I mean, there there's you know it's a real issue for many of our students, particularly when they first get here. Yeah, I actually want to piggyback on that for a second. So I think one of the biggest challenges um, that students face, and I'm going to talk about outside the classroom, um, is a acculturation, AC culturation. Um, so part of the problem is that you're trying to manage one culture or more, and then you want to assimilate them. Um, so I can tell you, because it's kind of funny for Moroccans, we're always in a very special position. Somehow you're North African, but also you're pseudo-European, but also you're culturally like thought of as Middle Eastern, even though you're not. Uh, we're like one of the few quote unquote Arabs that can understand all the other Arabs, but they cannot understand us back. Um, and so typically what we have to balance is like, an Islamic type culture with a European type culture, because most of our friends go study in France, not the US. And then you have to balance that out with the local US culture. And then it, 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 it can make you dizzy. <laughs> so uh, what I'm trying to say is that many international students will face this exact challenge, which is trying to balance different cultures at once and trying to survive that. And that can be anxiety inducing and also in many places, asking for help is just not a thing, culturally speaking, like we pointed to before. And so uh, you might think that, you know, it, it's, it, it will be natural for students to just go and seek help. You know, it's a uh, counseling and psychological services they have at the college, but they won't. You know, unless somebody tells them that or advises them to do so, they're often going to deal with lots of you know, anxiety and stress on their own, some level of isolation, for example, you know, not all communities are the same. So if I count the number of Moroccan people that are at Stony Brook as students, it's probably seven. Uh, and I think I brought two of them to Stony Brook. So <laughs> you know, it's not a big number. Um, people will think, you know, people with like a lack of uh, cultural knowledge, which, you know, nobody can be blamed for, obviously, will think, oh, you're Moroccan, you know, you're an Arab and all that. So you know, there should be no problem for you connecting with all the other, you know, Pakistanis and, and whatever, but it's not entirely true. You know, we, we try, some of us, to connect to the bigger, you know, international community, but compare that to, you know, Asian communities. You know, you go to a place like Stony Brook, there's just more Chinese students. So a Chinese student will have a larger community to connect with. Um, so the challenge might be a bit different. Um, so anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is that students might face a lot of these challenges uh, 
at the level of uh, you know culture change. But I think another big challenge that they can face that instructors might not be aware of is the lack of opportunities for them sometimes, which can you know do do something to you as a student. For example, you know getting an internship is a real headache in the U.S. as as an international student. There's a lot of things that have to be approved. There's processes you have to go through uh, that doesn't make it easy. So you might not have the same privileges as far as advancing your career post graduation. Um, but that's uh, that's really it for the most part, I guess. Uh, I can speak to for now. I see a question in the chat box from uh, Rebecca. She wants to talk a little bit about assessment systems and grading and how that plays um, into the discussion of teaching. And I, I think that it's important for, um, for us as faculty to be flexible with our students, especially our international students. Um, a small example would be if, uh, if you're asking for a five or six page paper, maybe ask the international students if they're having difficulty in, with academic writing to produce two or three pages, for example. Or if, uh, if a readings can be shortened, um, if there's a 10 page reading, but the student can still reach the, the goal, the objective of the course by reading two or three pages, that would be helpful too. Um, I think it's really important to be flexible with international students. And I also think that um, requiring them to see you during office hours is a really effective way of, of reaching and helping them. Um, and I, I suggest that you do that at the very start of the semester. This way they feel comfortable um, developing a rapport like Troy was saying at the start of this discussion, which is really important. I don't know I if, that, if yeah. that helps Rebecca. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I um, I could just add on to that a little bit. Um, now I forgot what I was gonna say because I was reading something else in the chat. Um, but yeah, I just, I wanted to add on to that. And um, where did my document go? Sorry, I have my notes here. Is but, it related um, to making the assessments? Like yeah, so- um, Assignments. This is definitely a place where I learned very quickly <laughs> when I was teaching my 102 class. Um, and this is particularly something I noticed in person because it's just easier to see what's going on in the classroom. But I assigned a lot of um, paired activities or even do some work individually. And I would give what I thought was a sufficient amount of time for it, right? But then I noticed that in particular, my international students or non-native English speaking students were having trouble finishing on time. So I would wait until they finished, but that sort of then made them this other group in the class instead of everybody being at the same place. And it was sort of very noticeable that they were taking long and it sort of seemed to be stressing them out. Um, so then, you know, echoing back to what Liz said, where if you can cut down the length or the amount of reading or writing, but still achieve your learning goal, um, that can work across the board for all students and not single out any individuals. Just, just to follow up on that, um, um, one thing that I've found was that often, my assessments, particular assignments instructions, um, were often difficult for students to understand because I am an English major and I like to have multiple compound complex, you know, embedded clauses <laughs> where, you know, what's the reference is way, you know, way back in the original text or whatever. And students were getting a little confused. And so what I found is just simply, it's not changing the rigor of the assessment. It's just maybe making the instructions much more simple, simplified so that the students are able to really understand what it is that they're expected to do. And, and what I always try to say is, you know, you, we are always balancing rigor because we're, you know, we're not trying to make exceptions for international students and in, in saying that they don't, you know, need to meet the rigors of the course. But also I, what I find is a good rubric with, um, you know, really clear descriptors helps me make sure that I'm actually assessing the outcome of that I'm trying to measure and not double uh, penalizing students. Like, you know, sometimes we look at the grammar and then it's like, I, I found myself, I was like without a good rubric that really kind of guided on what it is that I'm actually assessing, that I'm not actually like, you know, penalizing them more because perhaps their, their English isn't perfect, um, but yet the concepts are there. And is it that I'm trying to assess that they understand the concept or they're able to articulate the concept in a way that shows that they understand it? Or is it 
about being perfect English and beautifully written. And so I think, you know, just being aware of that helps me make sure that I'm assessing them fairly, but also making sure that they, you know, that I'm rigorously um, assessing them as well, so. Yeah, I actually totally agree with that, with everyone actually said about like how it's like the more understanding and communications make a big difference on everything else. For example, like uh, in the culture sense of like the idea of saving face is like, I'm too embarrassed to ask, or I feel like I don't want to ask because I don't want to see as the weaker one, or I don't want to be single out. So I'd rather just sit there and ask nothing. It's a big concept in the culture sense of like, Asian community, like I don't want to ask and feel weaker than others. So rather I ask someone else in the class or after everything's finished, I might like talk to my friends who may be taking the class, had this class before and answer the similar questions. But it also piggyback back to that, all, all the way understanding on like feel the connection and communication, especially this year. So for me, I was both a student uh, during the pandemic first started in the March of last year and also an instructor during the same times. So I felt like the both sense of being struggle with students during the middle of pandemic while you are instructing and teaching others. A lot of times for like a short detail is like, I'm teaching a class of four international students. And when I'm teaching here at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, you might not realize across the computer, the student is 4 a.m. in the mornings. And for staying up the whole night, uh, changing that perspective of because they were pushed back for international because they're doing everything in pan pandemic for international a lot of time it takes the extra communication like hi like I know you're in different like you're in different time zone right now is there anything I can help with is there anything like you want to give more like linear times especially group work during these times is very challenging for any international students so that extra mile step, sometimes people can say like, oh, it's not my job to reach that extra step, but maybe that extra step or extra email can make someone feel so much better and so much connection with professor and so less I worry about my face and don't ask that questions during this challenging times. And that can be the, the motivations or sometimes the tip for turning point like, oh, I need to reach out. I like to reach out now for a lot of international students from my perspective. And another perspective, like I personally feel I still have questions like as an international student too, uh, is about like the idea of uh, forming groups or have a culture sense of norm like normality, like in a group. So as you can see, a lot of uh, students when they first um, came to America, they are like to, they tend to uh, be in a group where they feel comfortable with. They might like, for example, Chinese students, they might join the Chinese club or they have a bunch of Chinese friends. They're all together doing all the works because there's always this one leader or like one club, they're doing this like knowledge communication. They like, oh, you need to do this and do this and do this. Sometimes they might be misinterpreting information. So for me, an instructor, I purposely to communicate with those uh, culture groups or culture clubs to have that communication on extra steps. Say like, okay, we're offering events for advising and these are student four. And when they heard kind of the information from their uh, native language or heard from like the people who are always hanging out with, they're more likely and more wanted to to be a part of this event and with that snowball rolling and might just just the first small step to reach out to the groups but the impact of having let's say 20 international students came to your office hour and then have 20 students came to your buying sections is a very big difference to continue on for that process for understanding international students I'll like answer. Just, um, right, okay i'll just I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to give a little plug for the Reading is Fun Club, which is a club at Stony Brook that has been around um, for about uh, maybe five or six years. And um, international students are um, paired with, with mentors, um, American students at, at Stony Brook, or I shouldn't say American students, but fluent English speaking students um, at, uh, at Stony Brook. And they form small groups and they read for fun. They're not reading a textbook. They're reading, you know, um, short stories that they have chosen to read. And they take turns reading out loud and they ask questions to their peer mentor. And it is, um, it's fun. It really is great for them. Um, I offer extra credit if they go and many of them do. Um, and it's totally worth it. It's just, it's such a good experience for them. Once they realize that, um, you know, that there are other students, not just in their community, let's say, for example, the Asian community that they can um, meet and communicate with, they, they do thrive very nicely by joining such a club or any other club like you were talking about, Chi Chen. But that's really important. I think um, we, we should encourage them to, to definitely join a club.
at Stony Brook. Okay. Um, so the things I was going to address were regarding the grading um, oriented questions. So I'll put a link in the chat that talks about academic grading in Morocco, because there was a whole study done about that. Uh, in Morocco, it's extremely harsh. It's difficult to get a good grade. The, the scale is out of 20. Uh, you can multiply whatever you want by five to get that scale out of 100. But the point is that a 15 out of 20, which is like an 85, is an A+. Plus. Uh, you know, as, as far as the US system goes. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a question about obsession with grades. Uh, are US students more obsessed because of grade inflation? Probably not. Um, I think I was obsessed with my grades up till the first year of graduate school until I realized that it really do, didn't matter anymore. You know, I just had to pass, you know, the, the comprehensive exams and so on, just move on with my life. But, um, you know, sometimes our parents have, uh, somewhat of a misunderstanding of the US system. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, you know, if, if you're from another country, um, your parents might think of the US system as a system where it's easy to get good grades. And so they might misinterpret, you know, what a good grade is or how high your grades can or should be. And so to give you an example, it, it's nearly a joke, but once my dad looked at my transcript and I had two A pluses and four A's, and he told me, why is the rest not A plus? He, he truly thought it was that easy to just strike an A plus everywhere in the US. And I had to explain to him that, you know, I, I know an A looks really great and that it looks that it's more easily achievable in the US, but it's just not true. You know, it depends on who you have, like who's teaching, what standard for grading they set and so on. Uh, so are US students more obsessed? Probably not, just I, I would say equally obsessed. Uh, is it easier or harder to get good grades in different systems as far as Rebecca's question goes? Depends on the system. So I, I give Morocco as an example because I'm familiar with that. But I think the only problem with the system in Morocco is that we don't have a good standard of when somebody fails. That's all. But other than that, you know, you can easily draw up a table of equivalent grades. And, and from there, the interpretations, I think, are pretty much the same, actually. Uh, and there was one question directed to me in Xinjiang, I think, from Namia. Um, as far as grading goes, uh, when I was an instructor, personally, I, I only cared about whether students were doing well or not. I didn't necessarily set a different standard depending on whether they were international, but I taught math. I don't think that a lot of the issues, you know, like ling language barriers and so on were super relevant. But in general, I like to grade uh, in a way where I give a lot of extra credit. Um, I give students opportunities to learn better with practice problems uh, assigned to them. And if they're not doing well, then they'll get opportunities from that extra stuff. And that's it. That's just how I grade. Um, and I tend to curve also. But that's just me. So, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So actually, sorry for interrupting. So for me, the same question, like, it's actually a very important question is like, do you think it's acceptable or singling you out in a negative way in front of other students if you're giving that like extra support to extra standard for entire students? I feel it's like the training wheel system. Like for me, I teach the entire one-on-one -on -one courses. It's more how they're adjusting to college campuses. I will not like single you out to like, oh yeah, you have 15 minutes more than everyone else, but more so like for me, it's the extra communications. I want them to feel the support and feel like, I'm here and understanding they're going through something more and they're going to a different intersectional layer of learning process and might take longer of time. But I really don't want to say like, okay, you because you, you, you groups are international, you guys get 15 minutes and if you're domestic, you're 10 minutes. I tend to not single out because of the entire saving face idea because they also don't want to feel like they're less than a normal students in the classrooms. So the actual communication will be helpful, but if you're pointing them out, they might feel embarrassed or they might feel someone else might mocking them or laughing at them just because you say like, oh, because you're, you're not good in English, I'm giving you a few minutes. Another thing we talk about grading is for me uh, to understand is what are their motivations to finish college degree? Because everyone has very different motivations to finish college degree. It um, depends on variation of like, you just want to get a US degree and then go back uh, to your country of origins and then success with a degree, or you want to stay a longer, I, this is a whole abiding sections of like how, uh, what their intention of what is the degree in US mean to them? 
and that have allowed their understanding like how important grade is to them. Like for me, even as domestic, I still look strong of my grades. I know it shouldn't be that matter of a thing, but I still always, it looks happy and I feel very proud of myself to receive that A plus or A in the class. But like, it really depends on what is your understanding of a grade or what does this grade mean to you? Does this grade mean to you as I just want to complete everything or does this grade mean to you, I want to do a grad school, I want to do a PhD and anything else. Everyone has a very different understanding of grading. And yes, for the parents wise, my parents have the exact same discussions. They saw my grade point and one, one of my classes, I got like a 85 on my midterm. They were like, oh, because you play game, you got 85 and some 90 off the test. I'm like, no, it's just because this test is hard and it was supposed to assess my understanding. But it looks very different in different culture values and look very different if you bring back this one understanding of grades for someone who might have different expectations. So a, a lot of time it is really communication and talking with students, see where they're coming from or why they want to pursue a degree, what they want to do with this degree even like in the one-on-one -on -one class, this is one, one of my biggest question for them is what do they mean for getting a degree for them after futures? And that really helped a lot to see, okay, this is what they want to do for the future and what are some even additional resource you can put in place for helping this one student. They might never realize this was here for them for the futures. A lot of students, if they want to be a business major, what are some type of connections you know or you know the campus has that can help them a lot, but they never realize as international student groups can also be very important by just little, this little discussion or a little question on what do you want to do after this degree? All right, great. Um, so we are running out of time. This has been a um, great discussion. I don't know if anybody wants to give a final thought. You can definitely give a final thought. I'm going to throw up a slide, a couple of slides just to give you guys some resource information. But if anybody wants to share any final thoughts, please do. Um, we do have um, a, uh, a, a listserv where we do, you know, continuing the conversations. So we can throw some of these questions out there and still continue to talk about some of these um, issues because I see lots of questions were still coming in, which is great. Um, so I'm going to throw up the slides, and if any of the presenters want to give any last final thoughts, please, you know, feel free to. Thanks. I'll give just a summary comment, I think, because a lot of I, what we've been hearing through all of these is just to really try to have some empathy for your students and be flexible with them, right? So don't be afraid to deliberately address these things, deliberately address academic dishonesty, use these things as teaching moments, talk about the differences between how you can communicate with your professors here and other places and just, you know, reach out to your students if you feel that they need support. I've done some like interventions live in class if I've heard students getting frustrated with other students and sort of just shut it down. Um, you know, so don't be afraid to do those sort of things as an instructor because those students that are feeling less than in the moment um, may really, really, really appreciate it and it really could change the course of their semester for them. And thank you everyone for being here. Yeah, I totally like I totally want to say that. Like thank you so much for being here. Like being here is like means you care and you want to learn more about how to make uh their journey easier and how do you want to support your international student population more. So by being here, like listening to us or like seeing different advice, but also like just talking to them. That little email in the middle of the night say like, oh, I want to ask you how you're doing can mean the whole world to them. So continue doing that and continue asking the questions. Communication is always the key to help them to make the transition. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for your time to listen to all of us to talk about our experiences. Yes, thank you everybody for coming. I just wanna say that I did put together a list of tips for, um, uh, for inclusive teaching. So I do have a lot more to say and um, you can just reference that, that uh, list on our resources. Thank you so much for coming. Great. Thank you, everyone. We've reached the end of our hour and um, we will be sending you all the resources um, that we discussed today. We'll be sending you a recording link to this video. And also, um, if you would like to join us for our celebration of teaching, I just put that in the chat box. If you would like to register for that, that's Thursday, May 6 at 1 p.m. And also, um, we will be asking you for feedback. Um, so please go ahead and give us feedback because we're always looking for ways to improve what we're offering through CELT. And we're always looking for more ideas of topics that we should be discussing. 
So thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. I'm going to stop the recording. Hi, everyone. Thank you.